Chapter 71 I Spy with My Kind Blue Eye. Prey stifled his yawn. As on the step in front of him, Gloom braced himself and knocked tentatively on Lily Blossom's door. It was afternoon, a few hours past midday, and they'd met up to try and visit Lily before the shift started, as agreed. Or, as Gloom and Crimson had agreed, Prey was just here because they'd brought him along. He would have much preferred to spend his time on something more productive, like an extra 45 minutes of rest. Prey had spent far longer than he'd meant to down inside the remains of his lair, meaning he'd only gotten four hours of sleep. But after the evidence he and Lemon had found of mimics attempting to breach the cavern, he hadn't had a choice. There was work to do, defenses to repair, runes to lay, and not enough time to do it in. Why did enemies have to keep coming at him? Why was it when one threat ended, another immediately stepped up to take its place? Prey didn't want to fight. He was tired of fighting. He just wanted to be left alone. Was that really so much to ask? Prey twitched his head. He could hear the faint sound of hoofsteps on floorboards approaching from the other side of the blue painted door. It was mixed with the unmistakable clump of a heavy stick. Lily herself, it seems. Gloom and Crimson both straightened as the door handle rattled, and the door slowly opened halfway. Half of Lily Blossom peered around the door, her good half, although that in itself didn't look that great. Baggy marks under her visible eye, unbrushed fur, tangled mane, and wariness dragged her face down. She didn't look like she'd been out of bed for long despite it being afternoon. Oh, hello, Sergeant, Lily said numbly. Crimson and... Pray. We're not on duty. It's just Gloom. Gloom automatically responded before he could stop himself. He winced and hurriedly reached up to slide his new, plumeless helmet to prove it. We're not on duty, he repeated. We just came by to see you before our shift started. Lily looked over at Crimson and Pray, both of them standing silently behind Gloom. Oh no. Why do they have to come? I don't want to see any pony. This must be Saffron's doing, she was thinking. Why are you here? I'm fine. Thanks for checking, though. You can go now, Lily said tonelessly. I don't like lies, Crimson stated from next to Prey, beating gloom and pointing out the obvious falsehood of Lily's words. The visible half of Lily withdrew an inch further behind the door. Yeah, well, it's not your problem, and you can't help, so you can go now. Why they have to come by? Every pony is. First Saffron, then Scenic and Carton. Now them. Oh, I just want to be left alone. Oh, the feeling's mutual. I have things I'd much rather be doing, Prey thought. He didn't want to be around Lily. He and her still hadn't actually spoken. He'd merely been present with either Gloom or Crimson every other time they'd met since the hospital. She hadn't said a word to him about his amputation of her leg and grafting in of the meld wood. And if that conversation never happened at all, it would be too soon. I, uh... Uh... Gloom sought for words, shifting from hoof to hoof before the doorstep. What can I say here? I... We want to help if there's anything we can help with, Lily. We meant what we said in the hospital. You're part of our squad, even if you don't decide to resume active duty. We were all there in Mayflower. Cedic too, even if he can't be here right now. We want to help. Thanks, but I don't need anything. So you can just leave, Lily quickly said. This wasn't going anywhere. Lily didn't want to see them. It was obvious. She just wanted to retreat into herself and be left alone. She would have already succeeded, if not for Saffron and Carton Juice's Samaritan efforts. The three of them knew the two mares were coming around to see Lily every day, and were actually getting in through the door, unlike them. Lily had a harder time denying the two concerned, sincere mares than them, it seemed. Maybe precisely because those two hadn't been there, and hadn't seen the horrors the ISND had faced. Lily saw how she wasn't convincing anyone. Oh, I don't need anything, really. Saffron's helped. He's helping me around the house. You don't need to waste your time coming by all the time. Please go away. Prey caught the lightning quick look Gloom and Crimson exchanged, making Gloom grimace. If that's what you want, then we can leave. For now. 
but we'll be back. And the time after that, and the time after that, too. We had not given up on you, Lily. We didn't back then in the wilds. So we're definitely not going to now that we're back. The old Lily would have fumed until smoke came out of her ears if she'd been subjected to that patronizing statement. No matter how genuine the sentiments might have been. The Lily of now barely narrowed her one visible eye, before the anger spluttered out like a snuffed candle. I don't need anything. You're just wasting your time. You should get going. I don't want to make you late. All guards are supposed to report for their post five minutes early. Pray, do something. Crimson muttered out of the corner of his mouth. Do what? Pray whispered back. Something. Just do your thing. Talk. Damn it all. What was he supposed to do? How were you supposed to help someone who didn't want help escaping the great grip of despair? Moreover, he didn't care to help. Lily's situation was all of her own making. If not for Prey, she'd already be long dead. What more could he do? Prey was tired and their day had only just begun. He didn't want to have to be dealing with this already. But it seemed he'd have to at least give it a try. For gloom and crimson's sakes. He spoke up loudly. Where's your anger gone, Lily? Where's it gone, huh? Has it all burnt up already? They all paused looking at him in confusion. Prey jerked his chin at Lily, half hidden behind the door. Where's it gone? You were angry all the time when you were with us. Where's all that anger gone? Why are you hiding behind that door? You're not fooling anyone, least of all us. Glim hurriedly tried to motion Prey to cease. Uh, I don't think this is helping. Where's your anger, huh? Doesn't hot anger feel better than empty despair? You are all about how the world should be fair and just. Now you see it isn't. Just like we told you over and over. But would you listen? No. Now your anger's gone because we were right and you were wrong. One side of Prey's mouth twisted up, and he smiled seemingly in lighthearted amusement at Lily. Where's all that presumptuous rage against an unfair world now? So your magic's gone. <laughs> so what? Welcome to being normal, just like everybody else not born with a horn. But I see that's not good enough for you. Prey pretended to admire the street they stood on, looking at the paved walkways, the clean gutters, the neat houses and trimmed hedges. Still being alive, living a life of luxury in the capital city of Equestria. Free medical care, clean running water, enough food. But obviously that's not good enough for the great Lily Blossom. You know, I'm honestly surprised you haven't taken up Nighthawk's offer yet. Remember the one? About how he'd hold the knife for you, hmm? Pray, you cut off my leg, Lily exclaimed, but her words were merely a reaction, with no force behind them. I saved your life. Crimson exhausted himself to the point of near death and a coma to get that meldwood so you could live. And then, because of you and the wolfing wood, we nearly all got eaten when it... Never mind that. So your family rejected you. Well, stuff them! No family worth half a bit would ever abandon each other. Which means either they haven't really abandoned you, or they weren't worth caring about in the first place. But either way, be angry at them. They did you wrong, so feel angry. You, you don't know what happened. I don't care. They're not my family, so I literally couldn't care less if you paid me to. Make up with them. Don't make up with them. The only one who's going to win or lose is you. Pray jabbed his hoof at her, his smile gone, replaced with a sneer. But whatever the case... Be angry about it. You think everything's unfair? Naive, but okay. It's an understandable reaction. Be angry about it. Fight to get what you mistakenly think is fair. And when you don't get it, be angry. Anger is just a crutch. But you know what a crutch does. It allows you to walk without falling flat on your face. Prey took a deep breath, making a show of collecting himself and smoothing a hoof down his ears then turned without another word and walked away. He knew the way to the palace just fine. He wasn't bound to either gloom or crimson. There. He'd made his one attempt to jolt Lily from her downward spiral only on crimson's request. 
So now he was washing his hooves of this stupid mare. Damn it. For all this talk of anger, it was him who had gotten angry. He hadn't wanted to interact with Lily at all in the first place. And just everything about her and her stupid attitude annoyed him. If she gets it into her head to come after me in misguided revenge for amputating her leg and saving her life, I'm going to finish the job and kill her, Prey thought. It didn't matter that if their positions had been reversed, he would have already killed her in revenge. Because that was just a hypothetical, and he wasn't the one it had happened to. Lily Blossom could go take a running jump. <laughs> Metaphorically. Gloom and Crimson caught up with him before he'd even gone down two streets, wordlessly falling into their usual positions. Gloom in the lead and Crimson to the right hoof side next to Prey. Focusing on her anger will not be good for her, Crimson eventually said as they trotted up the street. No, it won't, Prey agreed. But it might be enough to get Lily past this, Crimson admitted. That was the plan. Like I said, anger is a crutch. I don't like your plan, Gloom said. Prey kept walking as he answered unhurriedly. That's because it's not a good plan. Trying to survive off her anger as a substitute for the willpower to actually care about living isn't sustainable. She'll only just hurt herself in the long run by relying on this method. So why tell her to? Gloom asked. But Gloom wasn't really asking, because he already knew why. Gloom knew the reason, and Prey knew he knew. Gloom was just pointing out that it was wrong because he felt he had to. The reason for why Prey had advised Lily to anger was because it was easy. Anger is easy to spark, but hard to keep burning day after day. But since Lily was already sinking while ignoring the lifeline she was being thrown, shoving her down deeper just so she'd struggle and fight back just to be contrary was as good a plan as any. So what Prey said was, You know why. Gloom bobbed his head side to side as if he wanted to shake it, but couldn't honestly do so. Ugh. Gloom gave up and just nodded. I do know why. It's still wrong, though. Neither Prey or Crimson were disagreeing on that point, but neither did Lily have the mental fortitude the three of them did. She didn't have the experience of knowing how to heal around the cracks. This was the first real hardship she'd ever experienced, and it just so happened to be one of the real hard ones, too. If this doesn't work for her, though, Gloom fretted. Then we will try again and again, Crimson said simply. He nodded down at Prey. Thank you for trying at least. Lily will be all right. Probably. She has saffron swirl and carton juice supporting and doting on her, Prey further reassured Gloom. He didn't really care. He just didn't want Gloom to blame him if it didn't work. So he was preemptively covering his back by appointing blame to Saffron and Carton, too. My back has enough scars already, thanks. Yeah, Prey's probably right there. Lily was kind of shell-socked after we left, but at least she looked like she was back in the world. Better than nothing. Wonder how Cenex's doing, too. Gloom's thoughts transitioned to thinking about the other absent member of the Ice and D as they approached the palace. None of them had seen much of the Earth Pony in the last week, but it's still been enough to learn Scenic was spending all his time with his mare friend, and the two of them together were also getting to know Saffron too, the glamour model visiting them and Lily whenever she could sneak away from her job in the paparazzi. Scenic hadn't taken any hints from Lily Blossom's disheartening family situation to try and fix his own either, but if Scenic could continue to stay off work and out of Prey's way, that'd be great. Putting aside the positive and uplifting visit to Lily's terraced flat, their day was only just beginning. There would be plenty of work to do once they got into the office. First stop was the mess hall to have whatever cookie deigned to serve as lunch for their breakfast. But then, it was on to catching a spy. After getting away from cookie after catching the very tail end of lunch, purposefully done to avoid being present in the mess hall with any royal guards, next came getting back down to work. A good lesson in life was that if you want something done, it's best to do it yourself which included uncovering their second spy, who they had every reason to believe was reporting on Canterlot's gemstone refinery. The igneous gemstones, to be precise. The ones worth obscene sums of gold. One spy reporting on the gem mines, and one on the gem refinery. They already knew about like a soil in the mines, and Nighthawk had agreed to setting a tail on him next week Tuesday, 
which was the day before he posted his reports to whoever it was in Grafonia employing him to spy on the Wednesday. While this wasn't quite the Aeus indeed doing it themselves, the night guards sent to follow Laika Soyo would still be more than capable of finding out how Laika got his information. Maybe he bribed someone in the mining office, or maybe he snuck it himself. Either way, they'd catch him in the act. But that came next week. Right now, they still had their second spy sending reports to the same address in Griffonia every week to catch. Or rather, identify. Once they knew who the second spy was, then they'd decide what to do with them. Whether to leave them alone and secretly observe, or just straight up arrest them. After a brief discussion, where Prey was outvoted, the method the three of them settled on was very simple. It was the exact same strategy they'd used with Lyca Soil. Simply march into the same post office the letters always went out from, and demand to know who was coming in each week to send them. Then wait until the person had come in, posted their weekly report, and left, before requisitioning the letter from the postal workers. Prey didn't like using the same plan twice, hence the need for a vote, because it never paid to get complacent. But at least word shouldn't have gotten around the post offices yet. Hopefully, at any rate. That would come tomorrow, though. Before that, seeing the refineries for themselves to get an idea of their security would be best, since the refineries were much more compact and strictly controlled than the mines where the raw gemstones came from. They arrived at the factory at 6 o'clock sharp in the evening, just as the workday was finishing. Factory was perhaps an overly grand word. It was nothing like the scale of one of the warehouses or factories at the lumberyard, before the unfortunate incident with fire and garrow, with no long production lines or towering cranes and machinery. But for all that, this refinery, which was a tenth of the size of one of those lumberyard buildings, probably cost ten times as much. The refinery wasn't some huge smelting furnace like you would have found in a metal refinery. The gem refinery wasn't trying to melt its stones. It was just trying to sort them, clean them, and then most importantly, get them ready for enchanting. The building itself was colorful, like a rainbow. Because of course it was. The different sections of the compact factory seemed to be color-coded towards the specific types of gemstones refined in each section. The refinery didn't have a front desk, since it wasn't open to the general public. Gloom pulled on the bell, and then they had to wait outside the barred security door for a clerk to come out from her side office to let them in. She nervously blinked at Gloom and Crimson, not even noticing Prey for the moment as she stared at the two stallions in armor. Um, hello. Can I help you? Oh, Pony Feathers, what are the night god doing at the door? We need to speak to some pony in charge, Gloom informed her. I'm sorry, but the director isn't in Canterlot this week, and if you don't have an appointment... Some pony in charge of the actual running of the refinery. A factory manager, not necessarily a director. Some pony who can answer detailed questions about your gemstone refining process. I'm not sure I can just let you in, the mayor tried, but it was a weak attempt. Gloom was utterly unmoved. Miss, we're here representing the night guard. This isn't a search of the premises or an arrest, but your cooperation in this matter is still required. She looked between Gloom and Crimson standing in their new, intimidating armor. If you'll please just give me two minutes, I've got to talk to some pony. She hurried away. I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Her departing thoughts read. Through the door, Prey could see onto the factory floor. The compact factory's workforce here were exclusively unicorns, and almost all their processes heavily involved magic or specialist enchanted equipment. For example... Prey could make out some sort of metal cabinet filled with different compartments, which you fed a gemstone in from the top and then it came out one of the slots. What each slot meant wasn't really clear, though. Prey bet you needed some kind of precious stone-based qualification to even apply to work here, or maybe just a cutie mark which gave you the same thing for free. One minute later, the receptionist was back, with a rather well-groomed but overweight sky-blue stallion in tow. She pointed towards the ice and D, still waiting at the security door, and then made her retreat, leaving the manager of some sort to deal with the night guards on their doorstep. The portly stallions moved a hoof down his uniform jacket. The refinery's badge stitched on the pocket, visibly took a deep breath, and opened the security door. Cold Bolt Third Sign, I'm the floor manager here at Gemlots. What can we do for the night guard? He asked, trying to project confidence. He wasn't able to meet Gloom's yellow slit eyes for more than a second, though. I'm First Sergeant Dusky Gloom of the Night Guard. 
These are crimson and prey. Because of a related side investigation, we need you to provide us with a detailed rundown of the day-to-day -day process of how your refinery operates. A tour would be best. Cobalt had missed the second half of Gloom's sentence, still blinking stupidly down at prey. It's really a sheep. By Celestia's mane. What is Canterlot coming to? Gloom cleared his throat loudly. Ahem. Cobalt Ursine. I... Forgive me, what? Cobalt jumped, ears flicking in momentary fright. We need to see how this refinery operates. A tour would be best, Gloom repeated testily, while Prey smiled innocently up at the pudgy blue stallion. What? Forget the woolly filly. This sounds much more serious, Cobalt thought. What's the reason for this inspection, officer? Has something happened? This isn't an inspection. We're just here to find some information to help with another case. Gloom said. Not an inspection. Right, and I'm Lord Tritonfell himself. Cobalt internally disagreed, but he could hardly say no to a guard. Our workday was just finishing, and every pony is packing up to go home. Cobalt trailed off as none of their expressions changed. Your day may be over, but there are plenty of hours in the night, Gloom told him. Now, about that tour. The factory wasn't that noisy as Cobalt guided them around it, explaining what happened in each section, although that might have been because all the unicorn workers were finishing up for the day. Their greetings and goodbyes to Cobalt as he came around died on their lips as they saw the ISND behind him. They stopped pulling on coats or packing away tools and stared. Cobalt assured them all that everything was fine and to carry on as usual. Prey warily watched all of them, trying to keep as many of the unicorns in his field of view at all times. The wool on the back of his neck was itchy with tension, and he could constantly feel a slight, stinging buzz in his hooves from being around so many passive enchantments on machinery in the refinery. He didn't like not knowing what those enchantments might be. So what happens when raw gemstones come in from the mines? Take us through from the beginning. What happens first? Gloom Master rather ordered the blue stallion. Annoyed and put out, but hiding it with what he no doubt thought was great skill. Cobalt led them to the first and largest workroom. On the short walk, they passed by an abundance of overladen workbenches, all loaded down with arcane and unidentified paraphernalia. Tiny bronze spanners the size of toothpicks, a massive array of different colored lenses, hugely complicated work vices with a dozen adjustable wheels each, specialized crystal lanterns shining with certain colored light, and wooden racks with brightly polished gemstones of every size and type set in carefully labeled brackets to just name a few. The whole factory looked like something out of a pony fairy tale, with all the shining colors and glittering tools. I wouldn't mind stealing the memories of one of the workers here. I'm sure there's lots of things in here which would be useful to me, Prey thought, turning his attention back forwards as Cobalt brought them to a stop. So, this is our sorting room. The pudgy stallion waved with a plump foreleg around the room. There was a wide, low metal table with raised edges taking up half the space, with the rest taken up by stacks of small metal barrels. Our unrefined gemstones come in those barrels from the mine, and we separate them here, as in, the igneous from the commons, as we call them. Like the wheat from the chaff. Then in the next room... How do you separate the gemstones? Gloom stopped Cobalt from hurrying them along. Cobalt ineffectively hit a grimace. He probably would have glared, if he could have held Gloomer Crimson's yellow eyes for more than half a second. Prey managed to go ignored, fading into the background, just like he preferred. Blast it. I guess I'm going to have to show them every single step. We do it like this. Cobalt approached one of the metal barrels and twisted off the lid with his magic, then picked up a metal scoop which was lying to the side. Prey was too short to see inside, but Cobalt scooped up a hoof full of rough stones, unformed and still dirty, but each with a gleam of color which hinted at the gem under the dirt. Cobalt turned to the table and spilled the stones from the levitating scoop across it. All right, so first we get the raw stones, then we check for any high resonance ones. Here Cobalt reached out with his magic and plucked a cleaned red gemstone from a rack across the room. He dropped the ruby onto the table along with the uncleansed stones. There's a spell we use. It's called Arkin's Pointer, and it lets us see which gemstones can retain magic best. This will take a minute. The unicorn pointed his horn at the scattered stones on the tabletop, and his horn started to glow, the blue magical spark slowly changing to a light green. After about 30 seconds of correctly building up the spell, Cobalt's horn flashed. 
he let out a puff of air and grabbed a thick pair of metal-rimmed goggles. First, we cast that spell. Then we look through these. These show if the gems are holding any arcane precedent charged from that spell. See for yourself. Gloom took the goggles, taking a quick look at the table, before passing them to Crimson. Only the ruby you added is glowing. The rest are fading. Of course. What does you expect? Cobalt huffed. Mostly every stone is just common. About only one in fifty is a proctor igneous gem. This is just to find which are, and which aren't. And it's the easiest bit. Discovering what level an igneous gemstone is comes later. Crimson finished looking through the goggles and passed them down to prey. They were too big for him, so he angled them and peered through just one of the thick glass lenses instead. On the tabletop, all of the stones bar the ruby had dim, whitish-green outlines of uneven brightness, but all still very faint. Even as he watched, the faint glow from the rough gemstones faded even further, but the ruby on the other hoof held its glow, maintaining the same level of brightness. Prey lowered the goggles. This all seems fairly self-explanatory. Cobalt picked up the ruby again in his aura, floating it back across to its shelf. So that's how we identify any English gems in a batch. Once we do, they get taken to be polished and cut through here. What about these? The rest of the unwanted gemstones, I mean. Crimson interrupted, twitching a wing towards the tabletop. What about them? Cobalt asked, nonplussed. Jonas will clear them away tomorrow when he starts his shift. No, I meant, what do you do with the common gemstones? The ones you can't use. Oh, we do use those too. They go to our various jeweler clients instead. We don't bother cutting them. That's up to the jewelers. But we do clean and polish them first before we send them on. There's always a good market for common gemstones. Amber, garnet, and yellow sapphires, for example, always sell well. Those cobalt just listed had one thing in common, Prey noted. They were yellow. Or the color of the sun. In Canterlot, the most popular color scheme was white and gold just like their beloved Sun Tyrant. So, if you all follow me through here, Cobalt tried hopefully, sighing in relief when they didn't find another reason to stay. This is wasting so much of my time. I need to get home in time for dinner. So here's where we cut and polish the igneous gemstones. We use those grinders to smooth off any rough edges, and then we use that rough wheel along with rock polish to get them ready. Cobalt pointed out the various heavy-looking greystone wheels, starting from the size of a cartwheel and going down to one smaller than a tea coaster. There were a large number of different wire brushes and scourers on a bench, seemingly made from different metals. A chemical smell hung in the air. The rough polish is acidic, so I hope you understand why I can't show you how that works. And cutting a jumpstone to the right shape is a fine balance. It's very important the shape is gotten just right. Why is that? Gloom asked. Symmetrical shapes can better store magic. It's to do with how the magic reflects off opposite sides inside the gem if they're properly angled and aligned. Also, the greater the number of cut faces you can get perfectly facing each other, the more complex an enchantment the buyer can put on it later. But the more faces you cut, the more precise you need to work, since more faces also mean smaller faces. Those machines here help you get it right and work out the optimal shape number of faces to use. Each hignous gem varies, and each different type of stone differs too. Cobalt pointed to a number of brass and copper-looking boxes, each stuff full of little grippers, small mirrors, and other unidentifiable bits. Prey hadn't a clue how the machines were supposed to achieve what Cobalt had said, but obviously they did. Nor was Cobalt lying. The ice and D hadn't let on, but they were watching Cobalt carefully to see if he was trying to hide or skip over something. It was always possible that the floor manager himself was the person they were after, but so far he seemed to be innocent of the breach in the refinery security. Do you get custom orders? Prey asked. Ha, huh. could you please repeat that? Cobalt asked, bending down closer to Prey, who conversely backed up. Do people ask for custom order gems? Prey repeated. It's ponies, dear girl. Uh, yes, actually, we do, Cobalt answered incorrectly, but addressing his answer mostly to gloom. At least half of our business is to the mage towers. The head mage will often specify if they're after a special grade, cut, and type of igneous gemstone. We've got a board with all their orders pinned up on. 
We got one just this morning. Tower Sunset, ordering a Grade 9 Fire Opal. So when next we get a Grade 9 Fire Opal, we'll prepare it to their specifications before hoofing it over to the auction team. They'll contact Tower Sunset and discuss the price. How quickly are custom orders fulfilled? Usually, I mean. Crimson asked. Sometimes we're lucky and we have whatever a buyer wants right away. Buyer? Not just the Mage Towers? No, not just the Mage Towers. Cobal huffed at the interruption. It's mainly the Mage Towers, yes. But Lords or Independent Research Labs sometimes get in contact too. Usually an order is fulfilled within a month. Sometimes two. Rarely three. Unless it's a very high-grade igneous thereafter. Like a grade 15 sun diamond, if you wanted one of those, it'd probably take half a year at least. Unless you got lucky. All those gemstones coming out of Canterlot mines every day, with thousands and thousands of bits on the line, but it still could take months to get the specific gem you needed? That showed how selective and rare the igneous gem market was. There just wasn't a supply available, and it had little to do with money. And make no mistake, there was a lot of money behind the gem refinery. Prey could see that. It made him think. For all Cobalt's talk of supply and selling to mage towers, he wasn't speaking from personal experience. The refinery didn't often deal with the clients themselves. They weren't the ones to haggle over the price and entertain potential customers. Because Prey knew the big and important mages and lords would want to be pandered to and made to feel like they were valued and respected customers. Because if not, they might withhold their patronage. It brought a flash of deeper insight to Prey. It highlighted the split contrast to Prey on what information their spy could be after. Is this about the money involved? Or the igneous gemstones themselves? Which is their spy master really interested in? Prey pondered on that silently following along behind Cobalt as the Blue Stallion continued giving the ISND the tour. Was this person in Griffonia keeping an eye on the refinery because of all the gold it attracted, or were they perhaps looking out for a very specific gemstone, like the sunstone Cobalt had mentioned? And what would they do with that information? The second option would definitely make the most sense with how they were keeping an eye on the refinery from across the border, but what would they do if the specific gemstone they were so patiently waiting for came around? The most harmless outcome was that they'd simply try to buy the gemstone when it went onto the market. The second and most obvious option was that they'd try to steal instead, either through one method or another. What specific igneous gemstone could they be waiting for, though? If indeed that was what they were waiting for, it had to be something rare. Something rare and powerful. But what? I don't know enough about igneous gemstones and enchanting to make an informed hypothesis, Prey decided. He'd make sure to share his thinking just now with Gloom and Crimson later in private once they were done in here. Cobalt was showing them around the rest of the now mostly empty refinery, only another five staff left in the building by this point, giving the ISND a brief explanation on the rest of the factory's processes. For example, the color-coded painted rooms indicated where different types of gemstones were worked on. Agate, carbuncle, ruby, emerald, sapphire, diamond, amber, jasper, and topaz, to name a few. Plus all the different iterations of each gem, too. For example, a fire ruby, a smoked ruby, a pure ruby, a hued ruby, a rainbow ruby, a veined ruby, a pink ruby, or a quarter ruby. Each type apparently required a slightly different touch when refining. It was only once Koba had come to an end of their little enforced tour, having come full circle around the rather fantastical factory, that Gloom began asking the really searching questions. The pudgy floor manager had almost half forgotten who the ISND were, treating them more like annoying but intimidating inspectors and not night guards. Kobo was caught off balance when Gloom suddenly changed tact. How do you ensure your records aren't being tampered with? Pardon? Records? What do you mean? Your records. How many gems you have? Which type? What grade? Your incomings and outgoings? And the date? How do you ensure no mistakes are made? Gloom asked. This was a question the three of them had discussed before arriving at the refinery. Gloom was just acting as the group's spokesperson. Cobalt's hoof went up to his chest, like he was shielding himself. Whoa! Are you suggesting we're being dishonest? That's not what I asked, but good point. How do you prevent dishonesty? We'll come back to my other question in a moment, Gloom asked. No pony whatever to that. 
We all trust everybody else in here. We're a close-knit, hard-working team, Cobalt defended. All of the ice indeed gave him the same flat look. One thing they'd learned about Canterlot was the ponies in it loved money. Just look at all the nobles and lords who lived here. Canterlot was the capital city, where dreams were made, and quite a lot of those dreams included fabulous wealth. Greed was a powerful motivator which could tempt even the most honest if the prize was large enough. This is a gem refinery, Gloom stated bluntly. You get orders with thousands of bits from lords and mages. Are you really telling me you have no safeguards in place? What? It's not like nobody would... That's never happened! It hasn't happened! Cobalt blustered. Gloom eloquently raised one eyebrow under his helmet. Well, not that it would ever happen, but every pony is always working in the same room as some pony else. It's a requirement, like in the sorting room. One pony to cast a spell, and the other to double check and log the findings. And we do a stock count every week and check against our records. I mean, once or twice an igneous gem has been misplaced, but it's always turned up on the wrong shelf or under a stool or something. So you carefully monitor all the igneous gemstones is what you're saying? Yes, no pony is stealing anything. How dare he even suggest that? Gloom nodded in acceptance. All right, but what about the common gemstones? What about them? Cobalt returned rather mulishly. Next to Gloom, Crimson fractionally narrowed his eyes at the unicorn. It wasn't much, but Crimson did it just right and Cobalt swallowed, going back to being polite. It was a valid question. What about them? They're just commons. We don't monitor them as closely, but they're still logged after they're cleaned up. But really, those aren't worth that much. Hey, if one of their staff wants a common, they can just ask if we probably say yes. We're a team here, Cobalt shrugged. So Cobalt couldn't think of a way any igneous stone could go missing. That didn't mean he was right, but he didn't seem willing to even entertain the idea that one of his fellow colleagues could be dishonest. Best move on, then, Gloom thought, mirroring Prey's own thoughts. So back to my first question. How do you stop your records from being tampered with? Cobalt didn't dare say what he wanted to say, which was, I already told you, no pony here was steal. Get off my back already. Instead, he answered, saying, We've got two separate accountants. They both work on all the books, so each one double checks the other's work. That doesn't prevent the chance that they're both corrupt and both working together, Prey noted, although the chance was admittedly small. If Prey could meet the people they were discussing and ask them some leading questions, he'd be able to read their thoughts and easily learn the answer. But unfortunately, the two accountants had already gone home for the day. Too bad. And Prey couldn't exactly suggest they return tomorrow just so he could meet everyone in the factory one by one to read their minds for guilty thoughts. Never mind. We're sealing the second spice report tomorrow anyway from the post office. That'll answer a bunch of our questions, I'm sure, Prey thought. And then depending on what that report said, they'd either arrest both spies immediately or let them alone to continue secretly watching them. Prey rubbed at the unevenly regrown fur under his eyes. This is all such a massive drag. Well, today was a total waste, Prey said checking the water coming to a boil in the pot. Gloom looked over from his seat on the floor. How so? I don't think it was. There was nothing at the refinery. Yes, I know, we still had to check, but it was still a waste in the end, Prey said in annoyance. This whole spy-catching initiative annoyed him to no end. Why should he care if some griffins were spying on ponies? In fact, he applauded the griffins for their good sense. However, because of the side he'd been forcibly assigned to, he now had to catch their spy. Not true. We learned how the gem refinery works. That knowledge is bound to come in useful at some point during this case. Crimson disagreed. Hmm. Prey judged the water in the pot to be properly boiling and went to pick some mint and carno leaves from the plants on his windowsill. Somehow, they'd ended up back here in Prey's flat after their day finished. Or night. But now it was day again, with the morning sun having been raised less than an hour ago. And now the three of them had ended up back here in his flat for tea. Or not tea. Or rather, not tea by pony standards, since it involved no actual tea leaves, just herbs from Prey's collection of pot plants. It was kind of funny. Here he was, 
offering a round tea like some sort of gracious host to his distinguished guests while they gossiped and giggled behind their forehooves. Well, there was none of that here. For a start, there was no tea set, just three mugs. No kettle, but a pot served just as well. Prey hadn't gotten any of those floor cushions either, so they were sitting on hard floorboards. He did have a low table, though. Well, low for everyone else. It was the perfect height for him, and this was his flat. Still, it was a bit out of the usual for what they normally did. Normally, it was straight back to their own apartments to sleep. But, well, Prey was past the point of questioning their strange interactions by now. This was the ISND. They were odd by default. At least they weren't making him go along to visit Lily or Scenic again. Gloom and Crimson just sat there in patient silence, waiting for Prey to finish. Prey trotted back to the stove, propping himself up on his front hoof so he could reach to drop the collected leaves in. Near immediately, the smell of mint mingled into the steam. All in all, it was a rather novel experience. Definitely a pleasant change to fighting, screaming, running, bleeding, crying, and nearly dying. Life is what happens in the quiet times of peace, Gloom thought, echoing the reflective sentiment in the air. Prey rolled his eyes to himself as he lined up the three mugs. And surviving to live that life is all about avoiding those breaths of incredible danger between those quiet times. Crimson straightened a stubborn pinion feather with fastidious precision. Gloom unconsciously scratched at his chest scar every now and then, armor removed, as Prey pulled the pot off the stove, carefully balancing the boiling water. Neither Gloom nor Crimson insulted him by trying to do it for him. Carton Juice would have certainly been horrified to see a child precariously carrying boiling water, or Saffron too. Neither would ever come into Prey's flat if he had any say in the matter. This was his space, and outsiders were not welcome. Hell, even Gloom wasn't that welcome. Minty steam wafted as Prey pushed the two mugs across his low table to Gloom and Crimson. Here! Is this something you used to do back home in your village? Gloom asked, eyeing the green-tinted water in his mug. No, but apparently it's the thing to do in Canterlot, so here we are, Prey shrugged, taking his seat. Crimson took a cautious sip, and still ended up burning his tongue. He put down his mug, removing his hoof from the clay hoof loop. Ow. Watch out, it's hot. Gloom grinned, fangs unconsciously flashing, and took a sip anyways. Hmm, this kind of reminds me of waking up in the winter back at the caves. You needed some way to warm yourself up quick at the start of the night. What's the other thing you put in here besides that mint? Crano! The tea was by no means amazing. It was quite similar to pine needle tea, or in other words, a popper's tea. This is what they used to drink on the border, aside from plain water. Prey swallowed his sip and lowered the mug. It really was still too hot. Since you didn't recognize it, Obviously, it's not what your clan used. What herbs did you use instead? Lemongrass and wild mint. That's what we used. They're hardly plants, and you can grow them even out of a crack in a rock. Sounds like an acquired taste, Prey commented. You don't want to talk. You don't even care what it tastes like so long as you can eat it, Gloom returned. Wrong. You missed the key word eat. You drink tea, not eat. It isn't a food. Unless you freeze it. Crimson interjected, waiting for his drink to cool down. But then it's just ice and not tea, so that doesn't count either. Actually, there's a thing called ice tea. It's a cantalot thing, Gloom told them. Prey rolled his eyes. That definitely sounds like something cantalot would do. Take the whole point of having a hot drink and turn it on its head and call it fashionable. I don't think ice tea is quite like that. As in, they don't actually freeze it, I think. Gloom offered, but he wasn't actually certain and didn't really care to know either. Hmm, Crimson grunted. Nah, Prey shrugged. Gloom was right. Who cared? It was knowledge utterly unimportant to their lives. They sat and finished off the weak herb tea. Prey considered how useful igneous gemstones would be to him in his rune work. The answer was not very. Gems by nature are small, too small to hold more than a rune or two. Gloom finished his mug first. But he didn't rise to leave. He was contemplating something. Pray, Crimson. At some point in the near future, say, three or four months, I need to return to my clan. I'd like to invite both of you to come with me. Crimson halted, mug half raised. Pray tilted his head, cautious. 
This had come out of the blue. He knew enough about Thestrals to know that this wasn't something Gloom offered lightly. This is a bit sudden. Can I ask why? Because I'll be going back regardless. I have an obligation to meet. My grandfather is old, and I'm his only living relative left. He's a clan elder, and he's asked me to come back. Said there's something he wants to talk to me about before he passes on or gets too old to remember. But I want both of you to come with me. They deserve to see Clan Childara, if they want to. I want to show them my home. Pray flicked a glance at Crimson. He was staring at Gloom in open surprise. So, will you come? Or do you need to think about it? Gloom asked, with just a touch of nervousness. No po- No one visits a clan's cave. I don't think an outsider has been allowed into another's clan home caves in over four centuries. You would invite us, Crimson said in disbelief. It's closer to five centuries, I think. But yes, times have changed. Princess Luna has returned for one, and we're no longer trying to hide our existence. Anyway, you're hardly an outsider, Crimson. You're clan bored and just as much Thestral as any pony else. It's only prey who really counts. Gloom nodded at the lamb. I'm an exile. The laws are clear. Crimson disagreed flatly. That hardly counts, Crimson. A Thestral's duty is to his clan, but a clan's duty is to its Thestrals. Clan Mirden can't pretend they even tried. Gloom scoffed. Still. Crimson trailed off, unable to refute that fact. Gloom smiled. You see? You'd both be welcome. I'd make sure of it. What do you say? This all sounds more serious than you're letting on. What would be expected of us? What would we be obligated to do? Or not do? Prey cautiously asked. There would be... some rules, Gloom admitted. But nothing unreasonable. You'll be guests of Clan Childara. Okay, let me ask this. Why do you personally want us to go with you? Prey asked. Gloom's hoof unconsciously rose to rub at his chest scar. Well, because I want you to. I want to show you where I come from, I guess. And I think you'll appreciate it there, Prey. It's not like Cantalot. It's... It's quiet. Safe. Home. My home. Although, it's going to be difficult getting Prey through all the caves without flight. He'll manage. We'll work something out. I will go with you. Thank you. Crimson told Gloom seriously. He turned to Prey. I would like to go. Prey hesitated on answering Crimson's unvoiced query about his own choice. Did he want to go? No, not really. He just wanted to be left alone. But his preference of choice had been removed from his life. So that left him back at the same question. Yes or no? Provisionally, yes. I'll accept your invitation. I look forward to it. Gloom smiled. Crimson did too, the unpracticed expression out of place on his stoic face and distinctly off-putting. Gloom snorted into his mug, and a snirk escaped prey. What? Crimson asked blankly. <laughs> Nothing. Just keep practicing that. The morning had come and gone, rolling into afternoon, and now the IS and D were rested and awake for another round. The sun was shining over Canterlot, the rain showers scheduled for earlier having already finished up and been cleared away, and now the street had that fresh, after-rain smell to it. It was the exact same setup as before. Crimson had gone into the post office and used his authority to demand to know who came in to post a letter out to Griffonia each and every week. Then Gloom had gone inside the post office under the illusion of a dust pony amulet to wait and make sure the postal worker didn't tip off their target when they arrived to post their letter. Prey wouldn't put it past the postal worker to feel righteously obligated to warn a fellow pony against the bat pony freaks, invoked guard authority or no invoked guard authority. It didn't even have to be intentional. The workers could simply let slip something out of nerves or poor acting skills. Their spy suspect this time, as they'd learned from the stammering postal worker, was a green unicorn mare by the name of Shamrock. Deja vu much? Prey dryly joked as he and Crimson stood in the shadow of a clock tower and waited. That's because we have done this before. It's not just a feeling. Crimson pointed out, watching the ponies passing down the street for any green mare heading for the post office. They were only a ten minute trot away from the refinery they'd visited yesterday, actually. They were hidden in Play's sight, 
this side of the clock tower being pressed up close to the wall of a three-story house. It made for an almost alleyway, nicely steeped in deep shadow. And also, incidentally, a place where ponies avoided. Pray couldn't imagine why. Hold that thought, because here we go again, Prey said, pushing off from against the wall. Coming down the street and angling directly towards the post office was a green mare who fit their gathered profile, wearing a prim, business dress with a purse at her side. Prey squinted, eyeing the purse which no doubt held her spy report, and also the mare's short horn neatly poking through her parted mane. Shamrock stepped into the revolving door to the post office and went inside. Same as last time, Prey and Crimson were left to wait, patiently watching the door. Every so often, Crimson flexed his wings restlessly at his armored sides. The revolving door was abruptly shoved up from the inside and Shamrock emerged almost stumbling. Her ears were laid back, and she twisted her head jerkily about, obviously trying to watch everybody passing her on the street. Prey opened his mouth, but the green mare had already picked a direction and taken off. It wasn't much of a gallop, but it was definitely a run. Looks like the postal workers were incapable of keeping their mouths shut, Prey said instead. The revolving door was shoved open again, and out dashed Gloom, disguised as a grey pegasus and wearing his long scarf. Gloom looked right at their hiding place, and jabbed a hoof after the fleeting figure of Shamrock. The message was loud and clear. Get her! And Gloom's reasoning was instantly obvious. Crimson was in his armor. Gloom was not. Crimson had the authority of a night guard on duty, while Gloom was using a magical amulet that was supposed to remain a secret. Crimson's large wings snapped open. A gust of air expelled as he crouched for immediate takeoff. Catch me up. Wait! Watch out for her magic! Too slow. Not that Prey tried to reach out to stop Crimson. The powerful thwap of Crimson's takeoff dried his eyes with the rush of air, dancing ribbon catching on his hoof as he raised his leg to shield his face. Prey blinked and looked. Crimson was powering through the air, wings beating hard for speed. He was already halfway down the street towards the fleeing shamrock. Pedestrians were in the process of turning to stare or ducking in sudden fright. Prey had a moment to feel a flash of pride that the electrite feather he created was adding to Crimson's performance, before Crimson dived out of the air and landed in front of the running shamrock. As in, it literally looked like a dive. Crimson's wings came in, head and body formed one flowing line, and coming down at a steep angle front hose out. If an average or even a merely good flyer had tried for such a fast transition like that, they would have broken their muzzle as they hit the pavement. But Crimson was more than merely good. Halt! Unfortunately, most people don't have the reaction speed of a cat. Prey didn't see what expression was on Shamrock's face as she failed to stop and ran headlong into the night guard who'd seemingly appeared out of thin air, but he imagined it was one of frozen surprise. Crimson was a warrior, and one in armor too. He also knew how to absorb a hit, which was more than could be said for Shamrock. Crimson moved as the out-of-control mare ran into him, turning sideways and rolling her with her own momentum. While instead of smashing herself into the unyielding metal of Crimson's armor, it still meant she hit the pavement hard. Surrounding pedestrians whinnied and neighed in alarm, not knowing what was going on. Prey even saw one particularly pathetic and fat red mare take one look and swoon dead away. Shamrock wheezed noisily on the ground, stunned and winded. Crimson ignored all the staring ponies as he swiftly pulled out his pair of hoof cuffs. He pulled the weakly struggling Shamrock's forehoofs together and locked the cuffs on. Shamrock, you are under arrest, Crimson calmly announced, almost sounding bored. You will be accompanying me back to the guard compound and holding cells. You have the right to remain silent. Now, are you going to cooperate, or will you try to resist? Shamrock's horn briefly tried to light up, maybe just instinctually, but Crimson didn't want to find out. His right wing, the one holding the electrite feather, firmly whacked Shamrock's horn. The magic winked out accompanied by a pitiful whimper. That is your only warning, Crimson informed Shamrock, ignoring the outcry of the watching unicorns. A second attempt will count as resisting arrest and I will be authorized to subdue you with force if necessary. Crimson paused, helmeted head cocked as he peered down at Shamrock, yellow eyes calmly evaluating. I'll ask again, are you willing to cooperate or try to resist arrest? Starry Wings sighed tiredly, despite Prey knowing full well the lieutenant's shift had only started ten minutes ago. Next time, I don't suppose you could arrest her someplace other than the middle of a crowded street. I'll do my best, sir, Crimson answered blandly. 
there wasn't much of a choice. She tried to run. It wouldn't have even been a problem in the first place. She was supposed to remain free and unaware. If that post worker at the desk had followed instructions and hadn't purposefully warned her, Gloom fumed, back in armor and dusk pony amulet removed. And that post pony is going to be getting a very heavy fine for that. Oh, I'm not reprimanding you. I'm not complaining that you caught her. But I've no doubt there's going to be a twisted and misinterpreted version of it in the papers tomorrow morning denouncing night guard brutality, Starwing complained, already thinking about how this was going to sink the low public perception of the night guard even lower. He'd be better served just giving it up. There's no chance of winning the public's heart in the first place. Now when you're Thestrals, and they're xenophobic racists, Prey thought to himself. Vivid Edge was present here too still shadowing Starry Wing and Screech in turns to learn the job. She flexed her wings, stubby wing claws twitching in dissatisfaction at what she was hearing. Am I understanding this correctly? These various newspapers can write slander, yet we are not permitted to put a stop to the lies of these ponies. Starry Wing rolled his neck, getting it to pop. I am afraid so, Lieutenant. The newspapers don't outright lie, but they will do everything short of that while also blowing events way out of proportion. There's a writer... Yellow Pages, who is especially against Thestrals in the Night Guard. But because he never outright says it, merely implies it, he's protected by law. We have been keeping a copy of the articles he writes, just waiting for him to cross the legal line. Freedom of speech is a right Her Majesty grants to all, but sometimes ponies abuse Her Majesty's graces. You're going to get overconfident eventually, Yellow Pages, and I'll be waiting. Both lieutenants in the ISND stood inside the guard compound, just outside the holding cell block. The sun had set, and the hallway was lit only by lantern light. Once again, only a problem for prey. Shamrock wouldn't get a lawyer until tomorrow, and was being detained overnight. She was sitting inside one of the cells just behind the door, actually. Her hoof cuffs had been removed, but prey was relieved that they'd locked an inhibitor ring over her horn instead. He hadn't even had to suggest it, They'd simply been sensible for once. It was a nice change. So how are we proceeding, sir? Gloom asked, jerking his head to indicate the locked and reinforced door behind which lay the cell block. Typically, these public cells didn't see much use outside of when drunk ponies got rowdy on occasion and needed to be detained overnight. Tonight, Shamrock was the only person locked in there. As in, Starrywing asked, looking for clarification. I mean... Are we waiting until morning until she can get a representative? Or are we just going to interrogate her anyways like with Kappa Pot? Starwing considered. It was the law that a person couldn't be interviewed without a legal representative present. However, she's definitely a criminal and a spy. They'd looked at the report Shamrock had been trying to post to Griffonia. They hadn't been able to read it, because like, like a Soils report, it had been written in code. The cipher was a different one too, so Prey hadn't been able to immediately translate but he didn't need to. It already proved beyond a doubt that Shamrock was up to no good and had something to hide. She hasn't said anything yet, Strywing asked. She wanted to be let go and demanded to know what was going on, but otherwise, no, Gloom said. Has she even given her name? Vivid Edge asked, one eye balefully shifting to the door. We already have a name, ma'am, Gloom said. But does she know that? Does she realize why we've brought her in? Vivid elaborated. I can't imagine she doesn't. Not after what Sergeant Gloom said happened at the post office. Starwing answered. Hmm. Never mind then. My idea won't work. I don't think I'm experienced enough yet to be offering any advice on this. Vivid shook her head. Unfortunately, that was my only idea too. That old bluff always worked in tricking guilty teenagers into confessing. Prey spoke up. Well, we do know who she is. Shamrock Leaf is, or was now, I suppose, one of the two accountants employed at the gem refinery. How'd you figure that out? Starwing asked, not in doubt, just mild surprise. Prey is a smart cookie. Too smart for his own good sometimes, but that's why he's in the ISND. I saw her name and job title on the sign-in board. I thought it might be a different Shamrock, but she had identification in her purse which confirmed it. Seems Cobalt was both right and wrong about their accountants. Yes, the records weren't getting fiddled with, but instead Shamrock was exposing them all to an outsider. Prey shrugged. Ah, so that's how you worked it out. Should have thought of that. I'll remember it in the future. Vivid Edge thought, 
not used to the widespread practice of identification badges and papers having come from the clans. Starwing considered what this new information meant. And what do you think would be the best approach? He asked, addressing the question to the Aes Sindhi as a whole. Gloom glanced at Prey and Crimson, raising an eyebrow which clearly said, Your thoughts? Prey flicked a strand of green mane from off his leg that he'd previously missed, and shrugged. He'd been the one to carry Shamrock's confiscated purse with its reports and various other junk in from the post office. I could crack the code on her report first, and then we could see what it says before we confront her. Plus, we can then decide if we want to post the report out to Graffodia anyways if we want to buy ourselves another week before Shamrock's and Lyca's employers realize something is wrong. Vivid Edge's one eye blinked in surprise. Just pray translating alone. I thought they'd all work to decode the last report together. Prey's idea is not bad, Crimson added his own opinion, and Shamrock will be more cooperative in the morning. I mean, I doubt she'll be getting any sleep tonight. Let us do for a night. That sounds smart, Gloom agreed. All right, we'll go with that unless Captain Nighthawk says otherwise, Starwing nodded. I want you to bring that report to him the moment you've cracked it, okay? We need to decide how to handle this since the original idea was to leave both spies free to see what else we could learn first. We need a new plan. Yes, sir. We'll get right on it, Gloom saluted. It wasn't hard to crack the code on the letter. It may not have been the same one as like a soil had used, but it was just as simply made. Based on the normal alphabet, still using vowels, and replacing symbols on a one-to-one -one basis. Almost too easy. Prey already knew what he was going to find, though, and he wasn't surprised when he was proved correct. The letter contained the weekly stock figures of the igneous gemstones found by the refinery. Unsurprising, seeing as Shamrock was one of the two accountants working there. Wonder if Cobalt will be smart enough to draw the connection when Shamrock doesn't arrive at work in the morning. Prey smirked as he finished copying out the translated report and put the quill back, thinking about the fat floor manager. This whole situation seemed very reminiscent of one which had occurred before, with the crop sharers and holders, with copper pots stirring up those riots in the background. Prey blew on the page to dry the ink, and then they were off again to Nighthawk's office. Tonight promised to be a busy night. The lightning's out of the cloud now. There's no point left in waiting anymore. We're bringing in like a soil straight away and interrogating them both. We'll compare what secrets they both spill and uncover the truth, Nighthawk decided swiftly, in his usual gruff, uncompromising way. The captain twitched his hoof towards Vivid Edge. Take a partner, Brembo will do, and fly to his house. There's two night guards on stakeout watching him. Take them in with you and they'll rest like a soil on charges of theft, bribes, and suspicion of collusion to treason. Some ponies stay behind to search his house, too, but I want him back here in a cell within an hour. Yes, sir, Vivid Edge said, making for the door straight away in her slightly hobbled gait, but a limp in distractor from her steely focus, as Prey heard when she passed, This is the reason we came back, to serve as Princess Luna's soldiers of the night. Prey privately thought it'd be funny if Vivid forgot Lekka Soil's address halfway there. How silly would she feel then? Canterlot was a city, not like the wilds like she knew. It was easier than you thought to misplace a house. The door was still shutting behind Vivid Edge as Nighthawk turned his piercing yellow gaze back to the three of them. Princess Luna was appraised of the situation as of last night. However, our plans have to change now. And since Her Majesty is busy tonight with Princess Celestia and not to be disturbed, informing her we'll have to wait until tomorrow morning. Nighthawk shifted to look over his desk and down at Prey. What did the Code report say? Summarize. Essentially... Just the weekly intake and outgoings of igneous gemstones from the refinery. The details were all about the weight, grade, stone type, cut, and estimated value of said gems. Nighthawk began tapping his hoof on the desk. Was there no message attached with the report? No pony was addressed, too. Prey shook his head. Shamrock didn't even sign it. She was just sending the reports and offering no interpretation of them at all. Her employer in Graphonia must be interpreting the weekly reports themselves which means they obviously know something about igneous gemstones and enchanting. How so? Well, obviously because they employed somebody. Some pony, Gloom mentally corrected, but didn't interrupt in front of the captain. To gather information on this. They wouldn't do so just for the sake of it. 
They must be interested in something about igneous gemstones. Sir, Prey added. So it's the actual igneous gemstones themselves they're interested in, not the mines or refinery themselves, Nighthawk thought. That's what they'd theorized before, but this more or less proved it was all about the gemstones and not the factory or people involved which were the target. Nighthawk's hoof was tapping out a pondering rhythm. Any thoughts or theories? Any pony? He asked around. We've discussed it briefly, sir, but none of them seem likely, Gloom answered, as Crimson and Prey shook their heads in agreement. It doesn't really matter, Nighthawk decided with a careless shrug of his wings. We'll be finding out from the pony's mouth ourselves come the morning once Laika Soil and Shamrock have sweated for a bit. Yes, sir, Gloom agreed. Good. That only leaves the question. Do you want the ISND to do both interrogations or just the one, Sergeant? Or neither, even? Nighthawk asked. They were the ones who'd uncovered both the spies. Even if Laika Soil was getting arrested by Vivid, it was them who had done the work. They'd been successful. Therefore, their methods obviously worked, and results speak for themselves. It made no sense for the ISND not to do both interrogations, but Nighthawk was deferring to them to make the judgment call just in case they had a better idea. No, sir. We'll do them both if that's fine. Go right ahead. We'll get right on it then. Shamrock now, and like a soil afterwards once Lieutenant Vivid brings him back, Gloom nodded. Very good. Dismissed. Finally! Prey thought, stretching his stiff neck. I'm sick of wasting my time on these pathetic cases. Let's get these jokes of interviews over with. Nighthawk was already picking up a different sheath of paperwork by the time they reached the door. A captain's work is never done, but he still spared another thought for the whole situation which Prey overheard. All this in less than a week since return, but evil never rests. We'll provide some good training experience for Vivid at least. Prey idly wondered how many of the new Thestral recruits were regretting their choice to leave their cave homes and coming here for a life of servitude to their moon goddess. Probably none, since they were Thestrals and had an unhealthy fixation with duty. In fact, the only Thestrals who seemed to have had the right idea were Clan Mirrodin, fleeing rather than live in a life of servitude to Luna, along with each generation of their children who were to come. But no matter how much Prey would normally support their motives, he could never agree with them. While there may always be two sides to every story, none of that mattered. They were Crimson's enemies, and for that, they were forever lost in Prey's eyes. Prey, Gloom, and Crimson discussed how they wanted their double interrogations to go before they went in. They weren't even going to be taking Shamrock or Lyca Soil into the proper interview room. They were just going to interrogate them in their cells for added pressure. Shamrock had been left in the dark. Quite literally. When they pushed the door open, Crimson carrying a lantern, the green mare, who had been huddling on the cell's bunks, almost gravitated towards the light before she realized who was carrying it. Prey saw how her previously neatly combed mane and coat were already in disarray. It had only been six hours, and already Shamrock looked to be in a state on the edge of a breakdown. Having her magic blocked by that inhibitor has really eroded her spirit that much already, Prey noted with scorn. How pathetically reliant she is on her natural gifts. That, or perhaps it was just because she was a soft, sheltered, privileged cantaloupe pony who was racist and scared of Thestrals. Prey knew the type. Shamrock was the sort who would spill her guts in a sobbing, snotty mess at the merest hint of spilling her guts. He bet Torment would have only needed to poke a single claw around the doorframe for Shamrock to see, and she'd be begging for mercy. This is going to be easy. The ring of keys rattled loudly in the silence as Gloom turned them in the cell door and pushed it open. Shamrock's puffy eyes went wider and she hurriedly scrambled off the bunk, putting her back to the back wall. The inhibitor ring was still plainly locked around her horn, so Prey wasn't afraid of her as they marched inside. Crimson swung the cell door shut behind them with a metal cling. Prey had a quick listen in on the mare's thoughts. Oh, bugger! Oh, sugar! Oh, buck! Not quite the impressionable and compliant mood Prey would prefer, but it was more than good enough for getting answers to the questions they had decided upon. Shamrock Leaf, take a seat, Gloom ordered, as Crimson moved to his left and Prey situated himself in the corner. Shamrock gulped, her mouth worked, but nothing came out. She swallowed and tried a second time, voice dry. This is all some mistake. 
take a seat, Gloom repeated, voice as chilly as the expression on his face. Shamrock shuffled back over to the bunk without looking away and perched on the edge. It was a minor psychological tactic, making her sit lower than them while they stood. Childish, but it didn't make the tactic any less effective on the afraid. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, no! Why'd I ever accept that job? Prisoner of the Nightmare Guards! They will hurt me, right? Oh, please help me, Celestia! Shamrock Leaf, Gloom spoke coldly, making the mare jump. I'm going to keep this simple. I only have eight questions. When I ask, you answer. Is that simple enough for you? Shamrock stared at them, at Prey standing in the corner smiling inanely at her, at the armored Thestral demanding her compliance backed up by an armed Pegasus warrior. Gloom looked down at her. That was question one. You're already failing. I want a yes or a no. But I don't want... Yes or no. Crimson snapped while Gloom didn't move a muscle, just like they discussed. Shamrock flinched at the harsh rebuke. I... I mean yes. Not so hard, is it? Second question. How long have you been posting your encoded reports out to Griffonia? Shamrock suddenly looked very faint. Or perhaps she was on the verge of bursting into tears as her guilty fears were confirmed. She'd obviously known what they had arrested her for, but she must have convinced herself otherwise. They found it! Oh no, no, no! What are they going to do to me? But, but, uh, only once! I, it was only letters before that! I only sent the one report! Lie! Prey chimed. Lie, Crimson echoed. Shamrock stared at Prey in a sort of self-inflicted, terrified stupor as she finally properly registered the lamb in the room. Shamrock didn't even react properly, just blinking glassily as the situation deteriorated around her and couldn't keep up. Why? Why have, why have they brought a filly? What? Why a ribbon? Prey gave her a mocking smile, tilting his head to more proudly display the blue ribbon behind his ear. How long? Crimson snapped again. He wasn't naturally good at doing intimidation, but the blank, unchanging stare which accompanied his words was a sort of intimidation all by itself. But, but, it really was only one, it was only once, Shamrock stuttered. Gloom made a show of sighing. Lie, Prey chimed again. Lie, Crimson repeated. I, but I, 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 Crimson took one step forwards moving just past the invisible line where Gloom stood. How long? What's the point? I'm lost. They already know. Shamrock despaired. She blinked hard, staring resolutely at the cell floor and hunkering lower on the bunk. Crimson took another deliberate step forwards, bringing himself down purposefully hard so the cloud steel horseshoe rang out. Prey was pleased Crimson had remembered his basic pointers on how to intimidate. It certainly seemed to be enough for Shamrock Leaf. With that last step, the green-furred mare cracked. It, it's been th three months. Three months and two weeks. Shamrock mumbled. Thoughts a stew of self-pity, but Prey was hearing very little actual remorse in there. Just for getting caught, but not for being a spy. Why wasn't I more careful? I should've. I, I could've. And now the Nightmare Guards have me. Oh, please, oh, please don't let them hurt me. Gloom motioned, and Crimson stepped back into place just behind him but still very much there in Shamrock's field of view. Question three. Did your weekly reports include an additional passphrase within the code to prove it really was you sending the report? Shamrock's ears and head sunk even further towards the floor. N no. Not getting anything from my special talent on this. Not that it proves anything, Gloom thought. However, Prey hasn't called her out either, so she's probably being truthful. Gloom decided it was good enough to continue with. They'd be asking the same question of Lyca Soya later to see if the two spies' answers matched. Question four, then. Are any of your friends, family, or co-workers aware or complicit in your crimes? Shamrock hunched lower, main a mess. No, she almost whispered. Question five. When were you approached and offered this job? Shamrock somehow managed to find a moment to be confused through her self-pity. It was the same time. Also three months ago. That put pay to the idea of Shamrock being something of a sleeper agent who had been recruited years ago. It seemed she'd been more of an opportunistic recruitment, 
which unfortunately cut down on the likelihood of her knowing anything useful. Question 7. What made you accept this offer to be a spy? I'm not a spy. I just... Lie! Pray cheerily announced. Lie. Crimson pronounced. I... They... He offered me a wage. A good wage. I... I needed it. Needed it? Gloom shook his head coolly. No, you didn't. You have no outstanding debts or dependent family. We checked. No, you did not need the money. You were simply greedy. Shamrock couldn't say anything to that. Or rather, she was too stressed and frightened to think of a defense for her actions. So instead, she just huddled further into herself, tail tucking between her legs like a dog. I'm not a spy. I'm not a spy. I was just doing a job. They can't charge me for being a spy, can they? Last question. Question eight. Who was it that first approached you and convinced you to turn traitor? No! No, I never! I'm not a traitor! Shamrock jerked out of her shell, starting to incoherently panic at the word traitor as thoughts of banishment ran through her head. No! No! I... I don't... No, 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 never! I, I never was a traitor! You can't do this! You can't do this to me! You are a traitor, Crimson stated unfeelingly from his place at Gloom's shoulder. You can hide from the truth, but it won't change the facts. You have been caught supplying information to someone in a different nation. You are a traitor to the crown and will be prosecuted as such. I'm not a traitor! Shamrock cried shrilly, uselessly trying to light up her horn instinctively. You're not a traitor! Gloom cocked one eyebrow. Yes! I'm not! Not a traitor! I'm not! If you're not working for a foreign power, then you must prove it. Who hired you? Shamrock froze, mouth open and eyes wide. The ice and D waited, faces unmoving in the lantern light and shadow. Oh, Celestia, please help me! Shamrock took a shuddering breath, gulped, and finally managed to answer. Nighthawk, Starry Wing, Screech, and Vivid Edge were all present in the captain's dimly lit office. What was going to be said was too important for anyone to miss, so they were all squished in around the piles of night guard gear which still hadn't found another home yet. It felt like someone had effectively padlocked them inside the room. No one was leaving until this was done. This was serious. Six pairs of reflective yellow eyes and one pair of soft blue all looked between each other. The Griffin Ambassador, Nighthawk said heavily. Yes. Well, maybe not. It was one of his aides. Some poke, some griffin named Haflo. So the ambassador may not have any knowledge of his actions. But also, yes, sir, Gloom answered. Screech tapped his hoof once, the Thestral way of gathering their attention to ask a question. Nighthawk turned his head. Yes, Lieutenant. Are we able to just go straight in and arrest this aide for his crimes? I'm afraid we can't, sir. Crimson shook his head. Is this not a clear case of law-breaking, though? Diplomatic immunity doesn't extend to sowing sedition, surely? Screech asked. Ah, pardon me. I didn't explain that clearly. I mean, he's gone, sir. half Loaf was replaced by a new aide and returned to Griffonia a month and a half ago. Prey and Crimson already checked, Gloom explained. Starry Wing's tail swished angrily. That doesn't suddenly excuse the ambassador of all his underlings' wrongdoing. Haflo was one of his aides, even if he doesn't know of Haflo's actions, which I seriously doubt. He is still responsible for his aides' actions. Nighthawk's jaw tightened. Unfortunately, he is one of the Griffin Ambassador's aides. There are strict guidelines on how to deal with anything related to the Ambassadors, and none of them are straightforward. Nighthawk's reluctant words got a collection of dark scowls and irritated wing flicks all around. Moon Blight! Cowardly actions! Won't stand for this! Ponies and their rules, Prey thought condescendingly. If you had an enemy, you dealt with your enemy. Prey hadn't been aware a Griffonian embassy even existed in Canterlot, but apparently there was, along with Minotaur and Zebrican ones too. Along with the Griffins, all three embassies were situated together on a business street in Upper Canterlot. Prey didn't imagine the ambassadors and their aides had a very nice life here in Canterlot surrounded by ponies. No doubt they felt like prisoners in their own embassy most of the time, 
only leaving when they had official business to conduct. Or also when they had illicit business, it seemed. Both Lyca Soil and Shamrock had both confirmed that it had been the same Griffin who had contacted them with an offer a week after Luna's return, while Canterlot was still abuzz and uncertain. Both unicorns had individually been leery of the Griffin at first. Shamrock especially hadn't trusted the foreigner, but both had said that Haflo had been very personable and friendly. The Griffin aide had come to both of their houses personally, bringing his offer of a unique job opportunity, along with generous recompense. Haflo had been very convincing and persuasive by the sound of it, and had been willing to make their first payment in advance. 200 bits for each report, every week. Neither Lyca Soil or Shamrock had any idea about the other's existence. All they knew was that they posted off their reports and in the code Haflo had given them to a P.O. Box address he'd provided, and 200 anonymous bits turned up in their bank account each week from overseas. This is a huge bucking mess, Vivid Edge thought. All the lieutenants and the captain were thinking along similar lines to her, and coming to the same unhappy conclusions as the ice and D had reached when conducting the two interrogations. Haflo's flown off and we can't arrest him. We have no evidence against the ambassador, and they'll just deny all knowledge. What's more, Luna only knows what other damage the griffin did before he fled. How many other spies and traitors might he have left behind? This will become a diplomatic incident unless we handle it right. Nighthawk slowly looked around the room. We cannot have that reflect badly on Her Majesty. Her Majesty, meaning Princess Luna exclusively. Not that any of the Night Guard Command wanted to make any issue for Princess Celestia either. It just didn't occur to them that it even could be an issue for the beloved son Alicorn. This was not a small problem. It had the potential to be huge. Griffonia was a national power. It may have been less prosperous than Equestria, but it was still an entire nation with its own laws, culture, languages, history, army, lands, and economy. Even if you ignored everything else and only looked at it from the trade perspective of Equestria, Griffonia represented hundreds of thousands, spilling over into millions of bits every autumn. The right thing to do was clear and simple. The incorrect choice was not so clear. Right is always right, and wrong is always wrong. It doesn't matter how you try to dress it up or define it. Scale can't change bad into good. If a soul griffin had done what Haflo did, there would be no hesitation. But because Haflo wasn't a nobody, he was forcing the night guard to give him special consideration. It was the same problem all over again that Equestria had with its own nobility. Money and power are a shield against justice. This was a huge pile of rotting hydra dung as far as prey was concerned. Screech looked like he'd bitten into something sour as he spoke. So we can't just walk in and detain the ambassador? No, not inside the embassy. Yes, we physically could, but no, there are no laws. Nighthawk's tone grated. Vivid Edge turned her head so she could properly look at the captain out of her one remaining eye. I need to ask, sir. Sergeant Gloom and Prey and Crimson have already gotten confessions out of both spies. Haflo was the Griffin Ambassador's aide. Is that not proof enough to at least arrest and interrogate the ambassador? Nighthawk's yellow eyes narrowed. Legally, an emissary can only be tried in their own country's court. We'd have to hoof over the investigation to the Griffins and let them sentence the ambassador. Before, I wouldn't have cared. But Haflo was the ambassador's aide. What are the chances the Griffin Empire really were ignorant? That's the problem, though, isn't it? Stryerwing said. He might be and he might not be, but we can't prove it either way, and nor can we bring him in for questioning to find out the truth. Not necessarily. Everyone paused and looked at Crimson. Prey wished yet again he could hear his friend's thoughts. Crimson blinked at them. I mean, you said we can't bring the ambassador in, sir. So, what if we went to the ambassador instead? You mean to arrange a meeting and then ask him the questions anyway? Starrywing's ears tilted thoughtfully. I don't suppose there's a reason why that couldn't work. Screech and Vivid Edge each considered the unexpectedly simple approach and nodded. Not yet, Nighthawk stated. The moment we start asking questions about Haflo, the Griffin Ambassador will know what we know. If he is guilty, that is. Nighthawk almost reluctantly tacked that on the end. Evidently, the captain already believed the ambassador was. 
Without meeting and listening in on the griffin's thoughts himself, Bray personally didn't know what to think either way. Vivid Edge tapped her hoof on the floor to ask a question, and got a nod from Nighthawk to go on. I need to ask, but isn't that a moot point? When his two little spies both don't send the reports next week, the griffins will know we're onto them. Not if we don't want them to know, ma'am, Gloom answered. That's the one bit of good news. Since Praise cracked the code, and we already checked that there's no additional secret passphrase needed, we could continue posting dummy reports each week in Shamrock and Lack of Soil's places. Eventually we'll get found out. It's inevitable. But we have some time. They all considered that, Prey listening in on the ideas and possible plans his commanders came up with. Prey hoped they let it drop soon and slept on the issue for tomorrow. Or rather the coming night. It was late. Or early, rather. And he'd much rather be asleep than wasting his time being forced to attend a meeting for the purpose of guarding a city he didn't care about. Sunrise was only an hour away, and he literally didn't care if the Griffins ripped Equestria off for thousands of igneous gemstones. Griffins had very little magical knowledge or power, not getting to enjoy the advantage of having one-third of their population be born with horns. So what would they do with igneous gemstones anyway? Those were only good for enchanting. It might just be about preventing Equestria from having them instead, Prey admitted. I still don't care, though. So we can keep up the facade if we so choose. That leaves the dilemma over the ambassador, Screech mused, scratching the back of his neck with a wing claw. Yes, but it is not up to us. There is some pony with higher seniority and experience to make the call. Nighthawk pushed his chair away. We must inform Princess Luna of our discovery immediately. What? All traces of sleepiness fled prey like a downpour of freezing water. No, 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 that's not needed. But everyone else in the dim room stood to leave immediately, tension leaving their shoulders. Prey's suddenly panicked gaze darted around the room, but all those yellow eyes were looking forwards in anticipation to once again meet their beloved liege lord. They trusted in Luna to know what to do. After all, she was a princess. Ambassadors, embassies, and matters of state were obviously her remit. Zoma Greeka! What Nighthawk and the other lieutenants probably hadn't considered was that Luna had been locked away in freezing dark madness on the moon for the last millennia. She was still probably just a teensy-weensy bit out of touch. Or maybe they just didn't think it was a problem, since Luna was an all-powerful alicorn who could effortlessly laugh off the biggest killer of all. Time. But here they were regardless, waiting outside the night court's doors, momentarily to be let in once Princess Luna had finished her sacred duty of lowering the moon. Personally, Prey was fervently swearing up a storm within the privacy of his own head in Zebrakin as they stood in the corridor. Last time he'd been forced to see Luna, he'd gotten to witness First Hoof, the celestial body-controlling magic he was for now dubbing Alicorn Magic. And so far, the only thing he knew about it was that it was completely separate to Unicorn Magic, a completely different plane of power. Luna had both Unicorn Magic and Alicorn Magic, but they were not one and the same. Normal Magic was using a key to unlock a door. Alicorn Magic was crushing the door with a mountain. Prey's working theory was that the mountain couldn't be scaled down either. After seeing such terrifying power, and having experienced Luna's carelessness before himself, Prey would much prefer not getting any more First Hoof data to improve on his theory with. Simply put, Prey was scared of this coming meeting. Same as last time, and every time before that. The Moon Wolf was only slightly better than the Sun Wolf. At the end of the long marble corridor they waited in, the light through vaulted arched window faded from deep gray to the blushing orange bloom of dawn. Cold gray marble started the transition back to glistening white, royal red carpets and tapestries slowly gaining tone and depth of vividness. And of course, the omnipresent gold of the palace now became unmistakable as any other metal. That meant it was time. The two night guard sentries on the door who must have been just about to end their 12-plus hour shift, nodded in respect to Nighthawk and the lieutenants, shifted their spears across to their opposite hooves, and pushed open the doors. Prey trailed right at the back as they marched swiftly in, Nighthawk obviously taking the lead as the captain. 
The night court was a hall-sized room, and darker than one would have expected with the new dawn rising outside. The room had lanterns and torches. It was just that only a few were lit. Prey's eyes flitted around, warily checking everything as he always did. Luna was not seated on the low-key throne at the head of the room as Prey might have expected. The alicorn instead stood in front of one of the floor-to-ceiling windows at the side of the hall in her heavy silver regalia, looking out as her sister's son rose. They waited. Nighthawk did not announce themselves like some puffed-up noble. Luna may not have turned around, but she knew who was here. They'd waited outside at their behest until she had finished lowering the moon after all. Waiting was no imposition to a Thestral. They were patient warriors. Prey kept up the silent stream of cursing and worry inside his head. The silence waited. Finally, Luna shifted, a statue breaking its bound form. Her drifting mane trailed in a lazy afterimage as she turned around. Prey carefully avoided direct eye contact as Luna's gaze panned across them. Our good Captain Nighthawk! What, pray tell, brings the entreaty of my night guard command to us so late in the night? Luna's volume, as always, was gratingly loud on Prey's ears. And it wasn't just because of his superior hearing. Yet even so, was she finally toning down her volume just a bit? Nighthawk, now directly addressed, bowed, everyone else following suit. Your Majesty, may I speak bluntly? Luna nodded down at them, speaking as she languidly strolled like some great cat back towards her moon-themed throne. Rise! And if our captain believes it best to do so, we would be wise to listen. The Ayas and thee have found another spy. Both were secretly observing the gem trade and reporting back. As Sergeant Gloom predicted, it was about the igneous gemstones indeed. We have both spies in these cells and the Ayas and thee have interrogated them both. They gave us some worrying answers. Nighthawk paused in his summation of events. Luna's starry mane had drifted across one deep blue eye, but the visible one glittered with sharp interest. Now seated, she sat unnaturally still. Perhaps no one else noticed, the ceaseless motion of her ethereal mane tricking them, but Prey saw how Luna herself barely moved. Their goal was the true gemstones, igneous gems! A thousand years and the value to a magus in the art of enchantment has only risen loftier. What did these two traitorous Cretans plan to do with such precious stones? As far as we can tell, nothing, your majesty. They were merely lackeys reporting back their observations. And that's where the problem lies. Nighthawk drew in a breath over his fangs. Ah, which pony is their spy, master? Luna asked with sharp insight. We don't have any proof of a link, but the one who recruited them was one of the ex-aides of the Griffin Ambassador, Your Majesty. Everyone breathed in, waiting to see how the alicorn would take Nighthawk's news. Luna's head tilted in painfully slow motion. We art in alliance with the nation of Graphonia for some eight centuries past. Our sister has informed us of such. Yet though Barris does news that they are false and the ambassador has been playing us for fools. Nighthawk dipped his head. Quite possibly, but it is not certain beyond a doubt. The Griffins would do well to remember the lessons their ancestors learned. That we are Princess Luna, ruler of the night. Explain, Captain Nighthawk, what has thy command discovered? Luna demanded. Prey kept his eyes firmly fixed at Luna's silver-shod hooves, trying to keep his nervous breathing even lest he give himself away as Nighthawk ran through the explanation. Unfortunately, he knew he was the only one feeling so. The thoughts of those around him held nothing but expectant anticipation for Luna's solution, and annoyed disgust over the two spies and the griffins. Of course, he couldn't know for certain with Crimson, but Prey guessed his friend was probably much the same. There was just the faintest smirk of pride curling Luna's lips when Nighthawk finished. She looked down at the ISND, making Prey hastily drop his gaze. First, Sergeant Gloom! Yet again, thou provest thyself in thy unit! Rarely have we had a unit in our service whom we have had cause to praise so often! Thou hast a knack for rooting out infection within our nation of little ponies! Gloom bowed. Thank you, Princess. It is us one duty. Nay, 
it is still well done. At thy present rate, we shall have cause to present thee two medals at the coming ceremony. And nay, we have not forgotten that. Tis only delayed by one foolish problem or another. Nor have we forgotten thy contributions in this, crimson and prey. Thy sergeant's well-deserved praise is for thee both too. Prey was being used. He was enslaved to Luna's will. Nothing more than one of her possessions. And he was being used. He hated it. He hated her. And he hated being powerless to change his situation. Thank you, Princess Luna. He murmured, eyes lowered. Thank you, your majesty. Crimson echoed, briefly bowing his head. But now we must return to the matter of our duplicious griffin ambassador. Luna's voice turned to booming scorn. Whether he knew of his aide's actions matters little. This Haflo was his aide under his authority. A commander is responsible for the ponies they lead. Knowingly or not, he has betrayed our hospitality and trust. We would do well to throw him from our borders forthwith. One does not clasp an ass to their breast but cast it from them immediately. However, for a moment, Prey's mind went blank, and he saw war being declared. Death, famine, suffering, all because an alicorn overreacted. Punishment must fit the severity of the crime. T'would not do for this knave half to escape justice, as he so surely would if we were to announce his crimes to the world. He would go into hiding, like a sewer rat, and the chance for justice would be lost. This we will not stand for. This is our nation, and we will not have it corrupted by outsiders. We will not allow our sister's hard work to be undermined. Luna stood from her throne, voice rising and mane starting to twist and billow faster. Prey flinched, wanting to cover his ears from the booming ringing but not daring to in case it offended Luna. He was just a powerless observer here. He couldn't say or do anything to affect whatever outcome the Alicorn had already chosen. The Griffin Haflo will not escape our justice! Equestrian justice! We shall not allow him to hide behind the soft feathers of his king! He shall be brought to stand before our courts to answer for his crimes! And you, our faithful night guard, shall be the instruments of his retrieval and arrest! Arrest Haflo? In another country? Hundreds of miles away? Did she expect them to somehow... She did, didn't she? Insanity. That's what Prey was hearing. Not madness, but insanity nonetheless, with no consideration given to consequence. Princess Luna. For once, Nihok showed a moment of hesitance. He looked between his three lieutenants, who were exchanging silent communication as well. They looked back, ready to follow. The Ice and D held their breath, looking on. In the end, though, there was no doubt. For Luna had the clans returned from hiding. For her and her alone did the Night Guard even exist. They were standing in her court, before her hooves, in her palace. She was not infallible, and perhaps she might miss the smaller details, but it was still their duty to serve. As you command. Princess Luna has seen and known more than we can imagine. Our duty is to figure out the best way to do her will. But Luna was not done, however. In times past, this matter should have been dealt with with openly for all to see the griffin's shame. Alas, as our sister reminds us, times are not what they once were. Instead, tis best to pursue the art of secrecy until half low is safely remanded within our custody and he cannot slip away. Only then shall all ponies know of his acts. Then... We shall announce it in the halls, in the courts, on the streets, and from the rooftops. Princess Luna, Nihawk asked, seeking clarification. Luna grandly swept her hoof to the side. Why, thou shalt fly to Grafonia tonight! 
infiltrate their borders as they have so brazenly done with ours, and arrest Haflo in the secrecy of his own home. Then thou shalt return with the criminal to stand trial. Tis three nights hard flight to the Griffin border, and another one beyond. So by all means, prepare thy retinue for the journey. We have every confidence in your success. What? Just what? Just sneak into a foreign land and snatch a griffin without getting spotted once? And if they were spotted, were they supposed to silence the unlucky griffin farmer? And what about border patrols and checks? Luna was sending thestrals. There was no chance of them getting past unnoticed in a land of griffins. To say nothing of how Haflo might not even be in Griffinstone, the capital of Griffonia. Its rugged lands were vast, split between the low and high kingdoms. But Luna was commanding it. Prey stared, heart thumping. This was brainless. Why? Why were they all just going along with it? How many ponies am I permitted to take, princess? Nighthawk asked, completely accepting and already planning which lieutenant to leave in charge while he was gone. Either Screech or Starry Wing, Vivid will fly with us. We will leave that up to thy discretion and good judgment, Captain! We only insist that our ISND shall fly with you! What? But... Prey couldn't fly! There were trains to Griffonia, sure! But the whole purpose of this scheme was to avoid any chance of detection. Prey caught Crimson looking over at him, eyes wide. Glim shifted on his hooves uncomfortably. Forgive me for interrupting, Princess Luna. I don't mean to question your judgment. It's just that I don't see how we could take Prey with us. We'll be traveling fast and light. A sky chariot is out. Ah, but of course, who we did forget. Tis the simple problem. Pray shall remain in Cantalot during your absence, Luna decreed, casually committing to breaking up the ISND. But the end crimson must surely go. This matter requires your skills, Sergeant. Twas your unit who uncovered the traitors in our midst the first time, and now thou hast done it a second time. We foresee thy expertise being needed to apprehend this half low. Then Luna's eyes turned to pray. He felt their heavy weight bearing down on him, even if he was staring at the ground. Worry not, Sergeant Gloom. A young prey shall be safe in our care. The night guard would sorely miss his expertise in the field of paperwork if he were to go with you, I'm told. Mayhaps this shall be a vacation of sorts for all parties concerned. You in visiting abroad, and he in acquiring a role more suited to his age. But fret not. When you return successful, he will be here waiting. What else was Gloom going to say in response to having his worries answered by his sovereign but... Yes, princess. A good point. And it's not like Prey could have come along. Stealthy and speedy flight are key to success here. Prey wasn't nearly as accepting of all this. Except... He had no choice but to accept it. He had no say in the matter. As far as Luna was concerned... He was her property. She didn't even see anything wrong with that. When he'd been in prison, she'd pulled him out because he was useful. If he wasn't useful, what further use was he to her? Luna was an immortal alicorn, co-ruler of an entire nation, and until very recently, utterly mad. Who was going to contradict her decisions? No one, that's who. Why does it always go like this? Luna's spitting out some ridiculous order and we just have to follow it! Hasn't it gotten old yet? How haven't they learned yet? Prey thought, helpless resentment whipping up his mind into a froth. But really, he really wasn't even slightly surprised. Was it... sad that this was what Prey had come to expect? That this was the norm? He should be angrier about how they were being used, but it was hard when he'd never expected any better. Luna brought down one shot hoof precisely on the marble floor, and a sharp, almost bell-like tink resounded around the empty court hall. It was an overly dramatic gesture, but no less effective in the moment for all that. The sharp peal of sound bounced in their ears and riveted their attention. Luna stood tall. 
We have spoken! The griffin shall not escape justice for their offense! First Haflo the coward, then the deceiving ambassador! Go forth! Tonight you fly under the light of the moon to your task! So we have spoken! One hour later. And thus they were committed to this reckless course of action. Just like that. Simply because Luna said so. How many better ways could there be to solve this? And yet Luna had eliminated all better options with her snap decision. Better options which didn't have the possible potential to escalate into war. Luna was sending an undercover guard force to infiltrate the Griffin's lands with the express instructions to kidnap one of their citizens. How else were the Griffins supposed to interpret that? That Haflo was guilty of a crime didn't matter. It was a foreign nation exercising laws on their land. Prey's suggested plan of keeping Laika and Shamrock spymaster in the dark by sending false reports and code was now null and void. All because Luna did not want to wait. They could have gathered more information first. But no! Luna was sending in her night guard essentially blind. Information was priceless and could save lives. So why wasn't Luna content to wait? Was she that confident in Nighthawk finding one griffin among the thousands in Griffinstone? Or did she not care if she had to sacrifice a few lives? To say nothing of the logistics. Three days hard flight to the border. Probably another two beyond. All while remaining undetected and subsisting only off the light supplies they could carry if they wanted to fly at full speed. But if not, their trip would take even longer, increasing the risk once again. What about places to sleep? The shelter against bad weather? Hide during the day? It wouldn't work. This plan just flat out wouldn't work! They were going into the capital in the Griffonian Low Kingdom. Someone, anyone of the thousands of residents would see them, without a shadow of a doubt. Luna's scheme was fundamentally flawed. It would not work. Not without magic. And magic was something they sorely lacked. None of the Thestrals ever liked contradicting their beloved princess. But once they'd left the night court and actually had a chance to think about the logistics of it all with cooler heads, even they had to admit this wouldn't work. So we adjust. Change the plan so it will work, Nighthawk ordered simply. Prey was not going. Luna had said so, but he was still present with the rest of the ISND to give his input. He didn't like this sudden decision in the slightest. But since it was happening and he had no say in the matter, he was going to try his best to give Gloom and Crimson the best chance of success. No one's got any idea where Haflo might be, and a bunch of Thestral warriors asking will be rather suspicious. When you get there, try looking up the address of the P.O. box which Laika, Soil, and Shamrock were sending their reports to. Excellent point, Prey. While we are gone, it will be your job to post a set of fake reports to the address on the appropriate days. We don't know how long we will be staked out in Griffonia. Best not to tip Haflo off. It was rather quickly decided that despite Luna's instructions, it was simply not feasible to fly all the way to Griffonia. At least, not if they intended to stay there for any length of time without arousing suspicions. It would be better to enter via the train lines and simply present their papers so the authorities wouldn't have any cause to suspect them. It would actually be faster to go by train, since they could switch trains and travel day and night. False papers and names, Prey put in. You need false papers and a reason to be in Griffonia. Nighthawk considered that and nodded sharply. Consult Taffy Hobbs the moment we are done here. I want travel permits and a believable reason prepared by the time we leave tonight. Get it done. If we are not flying in, how about going in the Dust Pony Amulet disguises? Starrywing suggested. He half tilted one wing. We're rather conspicuous as night guards. An excellent point. All known Thestrals were night guards in service to Luna. It would be beyond obvious who they really were. Have Taffy prepare the false identification for Pegasi then. We will disembark in groups of two or three to better hide our presence. Then we'll regroup later, Nighthawk decided. That brings us to the next point. How many ponies are going? Screech asked, looking around. I, Crimson, and Gloom are going. Princess Luna has ordered it, Nighthawk stated, brooking no argument. He got none. 
Vivid Edge, you will be coming. Screech or Starry Wing, decide between you who will remain to manage the Night Guard in our absence. Three others, Bramble Weft, Umbra, and Nimbus Hoof. Nighthawk rattled the names off without hesitation, and everyone nodded. Luna had said the size of the task force was up to him, so it was his call. Why was Nighthawk even going, along with two-thirds of the rest of the Night Guard command structure? Since when did they suddenly develop spy-catching experience? Although Thestral selected their leaders based upon ability, that didn't equate to the relevant experience. While Prey did not like him at all, Nighthawk was still a competent leader and warrior. However, that didn't mean he was a good infiltrator! Prey listened to the plans being made, pulling on his ribbon in helpless frustration that it had to be this way. While they may be coming up with a way to make Luna's original ill-conceived scheme less insane, that only made it slightly better. We only need to keep our disguise until we can find and snatch Haflo. Once we have the traitor, we'll be cutting loose and flying out across the border under the cover of night. There will be no connection to the Night Guard and Princess Luna, and the Pegasi who we're visiting. We can't go in armor though, and only lightly armed. We want to just be average travelers. Although, maybe we could put one hired guard in each group. It would look overly paranoid, but it would be a good excuse to have at least a couple of us fully armed and armored. We are lucky the address is in Griffinstone. The Griffin capital is the only Griffin city which regularly has any pony diversity. What with business and trading. We could take a pony guide with us, or hire one on arrival. A local perhaps. Obviously only use our false identities, but it might be a great help in dealing with the Griffin bureaucracy there. Prey stood there in Nighthawk's cramped office. Not as unpleasantly dim as always, what with the daylight coming through the one window, and listen to all the plans being made. False papers, Pegasi disguises, traveling by train instead, a get-out route, multiple emergency message in a bottle spells, and an actual rough idea of how to proceed. And I won't be there. For once, I won't have to be there. But... Gloom wasn't thrilled about splitting up his squad. In fact, he was already worried. Not that Prey couldn't take care of himself, but rather that something would go horribly wrong. Something always goes wrong. At least Scenic and Lily won't be there to see it this time. But all Gloom could do as the Night Guard Command hurriedly put their heads together to plan was give Prey a helpless look and a shrug as if to say, What can you do? Prey couldn't even be angry at Gloom. It was out of the sergeant's control. Still, he muttered, I don't like it. We'll be okay, Prey. Gloom mouthed back. Prey didn't believe that. Gloom himself had thought it. Something always goes wrong. For once... Gloom seemed to be the one to read his thoughts instead of the other way around. We'll be okay, Gloom repeated in an undertone for Prey to hear. We'll be fine, a promise. Crimson stood next to Prey as the discussion continued in Nighthawk's office. All of them tired from the long night but with too much to do before the sun set and they had to be off. There wasn't much either of them could have said, and neither of them were the talkative type either, even if they hadn't been in the middle of a secretive logistics meeting. Crimson looked down at Prey. Prey looked up at Crimson and wished he had something to say. Something important. Life doesn't work that way, though. The moment's there, but you have nothing to fill it with and it slips away and just becomes another unnoticed moment on the pages. Those were precisely the sort of moments you regretted not filling the most only later, when it was too late. No, I'm being dramatic and silly. It's just a moment, not one of those moments. Crimson was leaving with Gloom, but they'd be back in a week and a half, maybe two. It wasn't that long, and they'd be back. It wasn't like Prey didn't have other worries he could be getting on with, like the mimics and securing his secrecy, but they were leaving him behind. That was a good thing. He wasn't getting dragged into danger for once. But even so, they were leaving him behind. Ugh! Get over it, you crybaby! Prey berated himself. Doesn't mean anything! They'll be back all too soon, and it'll be back to work in the ice and tea as normal. You'll see! Prey glanced sideways at Crimson again. The lanky Pegasus had a long strand of black mane hanging out of the back of his helmet where it escaped his warrior's braid. Prey leaned in closer. Hey! Familiar yellow eyes shifted to look at him, and the closest tufted ear cocked in his direction. 
Bray could have accurately drawn on a blank page exactly where all of Crimson's little nicks and facial scars resided from memory. Or scrawled. For all his talents, Bray was rather mediocre at sketching. Never mind. See you when you both get back. Before. But before this happened, before all the logistics were sorted out, before they corrected Luna's overly ambitious plan, Luna called them back into the night court. Or rather, she called the ISND back. It was right as they were about to walk out the moon-inscribed doors. Off to go hastily prepare for their coming departure tonight, Luna called out, Sergeant Gloom, refrain for a moment! Gloom immediately turned back around. Yes, your majesty. Nighthawk and the three lieutenants, who had immediately paused on hearing their princess start to speak, or rather shout, continued on through the silver-plated doors and onto their tasks. Luna hadn't said for any of them to wait, so obviously they weren't meant to, and whatever Luna wanted, she got. Prey looked longingly towards the thick doors as the two night guard sentries, now definitely serving overtime, swung them shut. The back of his neck prickling under his wool, Prey turned around next to Crimson and Gloom to see what Luna wanted. Prey found the alicorn looking right at him. His mouth was dry. He suddenly couldn't remember last swallowing. <laughs>